Hello and welcome to the Science Fiction Book Review Podcast. My name is Luke Burridge and this is the show where I review every single science fiction book that I read as I read it. There's no set schedule, it's just whenever I finish a book, I do the review, stick it up here on the podcast feed. And today I'm going to be reviewing an audiobook that I finished uh, yesterday and uh, it's uh, called Emperor Mollusk vs. The Sinister Brain. Uh, the front cover looks pretty good. He came, he squirmed, he conquered. A novel by A. Lee Martinez, who I don't think I've read any novels by A. Lee Martinez before, or not that I remember. It's a comedy, um, science fiction, fantasy slash swashbuckling, pulpy adventure kind of uh, story. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's one of those books where you could read it and go, oh, this is going to be a lot of fun. And it mostly was fun. However, it's... Um, it says here, uh, 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 published in, uh, uh, what does it say here? First published in January 1st, 2012, um, hardcover, 293 pages, and it's about seven and a half hours long as the audiobook. Unfortunately, um, the book itself, the story itself, is probably about a five hour audiobook. So there was a kind of middle section where I was like, okay, this is dragging a bit. And I'll, take, I'll explain the reasons why. Um, the setup is that Mollusk is a, was a warlord. Emperor Mollusk was a warlord. He took over Earth. This is all like uh, explained in like the opening uh, opening chapter uh, or the opening two chapters. He t- takes over the world and uh, comes from comes from Neptune. Every different planet has different uh, people on it. There's uh, you know there's Neptunians and Venusians and um, Plutoniums and all of these all of these different uh, planets have different uh, races from them. People from Saturn, people from Jupiter, and uh, and Mollusk is like a, a an octopus brain, um, or he's, he's like a, a, a massive brain inside the octopus body, which is then inside an exoskeleton suit, uh, exosuit, um, a mechanical exosuit, and then that's it. And then he flies around in a flying saucer in Earth, and uh, and that's it. So by using mind control, takes over the Earth, takes over Terra, after being kicked out of or wanted for crimes against all of the other planets, causing troubles across um, across the solar system. And uh, once he's taken over Earth, sort of goes, right, um, I've uh, that's good, people are worshipping me like God, like a God now, uh, and, I, and I've solved world hunger, and uh, starting to solve disease, there's no more wars, solved the energy crisis on Earth and stuff like that. Now what I've got to do, and um, so now pretty much he defends Earth from threats from the outside. And there's some st- some fun statistics kind of mentioned in the book that like 70% of all the threats that he has to defend Earth from and all the things that like other, you know, even mega villains that come along, they only can come along because he himself is there. It's sort of like 72% of all of the things, all the crises that, or the crises that you have saved Earth from were caused or a byproduct of your own actions in the first place. He says, well, you know, there's a pretty good uh, track record, the 30%. Um, that wasn't caused by me. I, th- I guess I'm doing a good job. So that's kind of uh, the, the setup for the book. So uh, an evil um, villain uh, guy with a big mind who loves building doomsday devices and weapons. That's his main hobby, is making weapons and doomsday devices out of just everyday uh, materials and uh, looking into the deep, dark depths of science to find other ways to destroy the galaxy, destroy planets, to destroy all of that. But not not using them, just kind of like uh, locking them away. And he has all these different vaults around Earth where he locks away his technology. He's got lots of flying sources, he keeps them all around the world lots of exosuit backups and things so if anything any any if he needs anything he can just call it over and uh, yeah and any bad like really bad doomsday weapons he he hides around the place um so the book begins with him battling in space a clone of himself um, in orbit and he goes onto a, a spaceship and he's sort of like ah who are you ah I'm another Neptunian looks very much like me I guess it is me, it's a clone, I guess the clone was a bad idea. He says, I don't often make mistakes, but when I do, I'm okay to to admit to the mistakes that I do make. The clone was probably a bad idea. And uh, so, weirdly enough, it says right in that first chapter, I remember right in that first chapter it said, um, what, well, the clone, what you did is that you left lots of decoys around for me, you distracted me by leaving a series of clues for me to take me around across the uh, uh, across the globe, I went to Lisbon and went to other cities and, uh, and I was tracking these different clues and different decoys that you left for me around the world um, to distract you to distract uh, you, this is the clone saying, to distract you from where the uh, where the uh, uh, real doomsday weapon was going to be. 
or is being built or whatever's going going on like that. And so after he defeats his clone in chapter one, it pretty much then repeats that. He then goes on a tour of the world following clues for reasons which wouldn't have been exactly clear except we already kind of know the MO of what's going on. He's sort of, is he being distracted? What's going on here? Who is distracting him? Who has learnt this trick about distracting him by saying, oh, there's a trap here. Oh, there's uh, some clues here. Oh, there's other things here. And so that's what he does. So this whole book becomes a tour of different places. We're in outer space. We're in a city. We go to Atlantis. There's some flashbacks to some other places like Kansas. Then we go to a dinosaur island in Antarctica and the fountain of life and all these different um, interesting exotic places and we meet you know Atlanteans and uh, other different races which we are shared with on earth because this whole thing is kind of like an alternate dimension earth alternate history earth where of course um, you know all the swashbuckling planets the you know the uh, planetary romance kind of things like Barsoom and uh, Venus and all these other places have all these um, different races in them so at the beginning of the 20th century when you know astronomy got good enough that they could uh, you know look t look at Mars and see that there were Martians there and look at Venus and see there were Ven Venusians there. Um, those kind of things are just introduced and that's just the way it works. And uh, yes, of course, Atlantis existed and there's a, um, you know, all these different, there's the mole people underneath the world as well, all that kind of stuff. So what we then do is have, like, as explained in chapter one, oh, we go on a tour following clues around and that's it. And, and that's for, like what most of the book needs to be, uh, or that's what most of the book is. And it became a little bit too episodic, sort of like, oh, now we're going to go here and we're going to fight, fight this kind of big monster or this kind of big robot and then discover a new clue and then go to the next one. And like I say, this is a seven hour audiobook, seven and a half hour audiobook. And about um, five of those hours is this tour around the planet with a few flashbacks here and there and uh, with fun character moments. But it just felt a little bit too long and dragging in that middle part. Um, of course, this is, it says, uh, you know, uh, the, the title of the book, Emperor Mollusk, Mollusk versus the Sinister Brain. The Sinister Brain is introduced quite early. It is the face of the enemy, but is it really the enemy or is there a final enemy behind the enemy? Is it the final boss? We're not quite sure. And uh, then he is accompanied along the way by a few different characters, mainly Zala, who is from Venus, and she is his bodyguard in this book. She's actually kind of not meant to be the bodyguard. She's there to take him into, to arrest him and take him into custody as soon as he leaves Earth, um, because she's, so she doesn't want him to die because he has to face justice on Venus. So once that's good. So the, so the whole book is pretty much, I mean, like, of course there's the main plots driving along. What are all these clues? Who who is behind the, whose brain is behind the sinister brain what's going on there but also like the main story the main subplot I guess is Zala uh, the lizard woman with a sword and guns and uh, a squad of Venusian um um, soldiers with her sort of like what they get up to together she's there for him to talk to and to explain problems to she's there to be you know make snide comments back and uh, be sarcastic back and uh, kind of say oh I didn't think you were like this oh what is going on here so their relationship is kind of the main it's the kind of the backbone of the book like the main character journey unfortunately it didn't really pay off in ways that I was really hoping for or expecting I thought their relationship would become a lot more equal and you know it might have gone in a different direction but it didn't really go that way I thought by the end sort of like oh she will he will understand that her kind of humanity even though she's from Venus but her humanity will balance out his you know evil genius technological science doomsday weapon expertness and between the two of them they will kind of solve the final pro problem but in the end it's just him and she's just there coming along for the ride even at the end and I thought it was a little bit of a missed opportunity to have kind of like some good character development between the two of them um, also, there's Gronk, uh, a, Ju a Jupiter savage who now lives on Dinosaur Island, which is quite fun, and Snarg, which is the Ultrapede, which is this, uh, I'm not really sure where the Ultrapede comes from, but it's an almost indestructi indestructible centipede, massive centipede thing, which uh, helps um, Mollusk get out of sc scrapes and uh, eats enemies and is generally a fun kind of sidekick, like the Disney sidekick, which is the animal which doesn't really speak. Um, that kind of thing, but also eats people and stuff like that. So, what we have is generally a fun, mostly fun, uh, interesting comedy romp space adventure 
um, tour around Earth, this alternate Earth where all of the pulpy 1930s, 1920s science fiction tropes are all real, they all exist, all of the different places that you exi think exist, exist, all of the different technologies that could exist, exist, um, and uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's a lot of it. However, because it relies so much on the tropes and the different plays on the tropes, I was always waiting for that big turn of like, okay, what's going to happen now? Where is it going to go for this to go into new territory? And for me, it never really did anything new. It was always amusing. The characters were always fun to spend time with, but it never really like transcended what the like normal tropes are, what the normal, I mean, there was some uh, kind of aliens that I had not seen before, some different biological things that I had not seen before, some different technologies that I had not seen before, but they were never used in a way which wasn't just, oh, big bad enemy that has to be uh, defeated in some way, oh, big bad weapon that has to be defeated in some way. There was never really anything there which felt genuine and new. And the worst thing is that even the story felt a little bit derivative, because I was thinking, haven't I you know, read this story before, and then I realized, no, I haven't read the story, but I've seen the story before because I've seen the movie Megamind, which is where an evil villain whose superpower is building amazing weapons and doomsday devices ends up changing his heart and, and ends up defending the city, or the planet in this case of this book, but he, instead of wanting to rule it, and there's sort of like some other troubles that he invented, he's created himself, he has to defend against them, and I was like, yeah, this just feels to me very much like lots of movies that I've seen where the, the bad evil menace turns out to be, oh, actually he has a heart after all and wants to look after the planet and becomes the defender of the city or the defender of the planet instead of the uh, the person who should be worshipped and the person who's taken over um, due to evil scheming and uh, and so actually I, I was just on the good I just looked on the Goodreads page and I did a, a search for, for Megamind and it seems like other people have um, uh, notice the same thing. Emperor Mollusk is a hilarious character. This book kept reminding me of the movie Megamind with Will Ferrell, and I'm sure you can guess why if you've seen it. Highly recommended, by the way. Um, and somebody else said, it's like a smarter version of the movie, movie Megamind. A quick, fun read. And uh, yeah, so other people have noticed this before. But there are a few other things which kind of like you think, oh, that would be interesting that the Eiffel Tower is actually a big transmitter um, kind of thing. And it was built back in the day. And it, we were told it was for the Paris exhibition or whatever it was, the World Ex Expo in Paris. And then it became a, a, a transmission, a, a radio and television transmission thing. And it was always a tourist destination. But actually, there's a hidden purpose. And it is actually used for dot, 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 dot. And I was like, all right, okay, that could that could be good. But also in the movie Tomorrow World, uh, it, that's exactly the same plot point. Plot point. The what is it? Tomorrow, Tomorrowland, Tomorrow World, World of Tomorrow. What's it called? Anyway, the one with uh, George Clooney and stuff like that. Now, of course, I think that movie came out after this book was written. But again, it just sort of felt like, oh, that felt a little bit too. Um, I don't know. A little bit. I've, I've seen lots of things before about the Eiffel Tower being, you know, some some you know scientific experiment popping out of the ground. Oh, it must, they couldn't have built that whole thing just for, um, just for you know, as a tourist attraction or just as a whatever. And um, there must be some nefarious reasons underneath it. But uh, yeah, it again, a lot of the ideas, like I say, a lot of the story, a lot of the character development, a lot of the side characters, a lot of the other ideas. It just felt a little bit uh, not not there was no, there was no core to this book which I felt was original in a way which made me really satisfied with the book. Again, if it had been a bit shorter, I'd have been like, oh, that's fine because it's just a fun romp, it's just a quick romp. But in the end, it did feel like it was a dragging a bit. Um, which brings me to actually, let me have a look on my notes now because I did make some notes here as well. Um, oh yeah, I may want to make a note of the narration. I listened to this as an audiobook, Scott. Aello narrated it, and he did. It was. A, it's a really good narration because if you want to think about what a, uh, um, a first-person narrative from the point of view of an evil villain Neptunian um, mega mind is going to be, this really sums it up. It's a very kind of like um, well-pronounced, clipped English, high-class English accent. It's sort of like, oh yes, I do believe I would go with it, but it's sort of like that same kind of. Uh, fun movie, 1930s British movie villain, oh, I say 1930s, but you know, that kind of pulpy era movie villain clipped English accent, and it really worked for me. And I think a lot of the, the book actually came from the performance of this. It's full of jokes, it's full of fun ideas, uh, fun characters doing stupid things and, and battling against each other in, in different ways. Um, 
and like I say, a lot of the enjoyment came out of those jokes being told from, uh, the, let's see if there's actually a quote. There's not many quotes on the side of the, the goodreads.page, goodreads.com page. It says, um, um, do these robots look armed? And I was talking to the dinosaur. Were you, were you worried he would disgust me to death? Oh, actually not a very funny quote. Anyway, robots, dinosaurs, aliens, everything is just kind of thrown into this book. And uh, what else was I going to say? Yeah, the pacing was a bit weird. No, I've already said that. Um, just had another thought in my brain, but it's already gone. It's already gone out of my brain. Um, I don't have a mega mind. I'm not an evil, a sinister brain of my own. I can't keep all of these thoughts in my head. Should have made more notes. Let me look back, scroll back up my notes again. Um, nope, I don't really have anything else to say. Wow, another short review of a book which was mostly doing it for me, but never really pulled it together. Again, there wasn't a moment, there wasn't a moment I wasn't being entertained, but there were many moments I was being bored by the story. Like, the writing was always there, the, the uh, narration was great, the comedy was good, uh, but again, just the whole thing didn't really hold together. Um, as a novella, it might have worked, but as a seven-hour audiobook, it didn't really come together. Although I really did like Snag, I like Zala, and uh, Mollusk himself was very interesting. Um, what else was I going to say? Oh yeah, human brains in jars felt a bit Futurama. Um, again, it's just like I, I don't want to just list all the things that this book reminded me of. I just wanted it to transcend its references, transcend its influences, transcend the pulpiness behind it, and it never really got there. And the ending, again, don't want to do any spoilers, but the ending, I was sort of like, oh, okay, kind of saw, see what you're going for there. I kind of worked out a lot of that early on, and then the way it was actually resolved wasn't as satisfying from a character point of view as I was, uh, as I was hoping for. Um, right, I, I, I think that's about it. Don't really have anything to say else to say about it. You can follow me on... Oh, no, tell you what, let's have a look what other people, my friends, look, uh, re think about this on goodreads.com. Uh, very Paul rated it four stars. Very entertaining. It was hard to put down. Good choice if you're looking for something light and off the wall. Zivin rated it five stars. Uh, okay, five stars is a bit much, but this is the best A. Lee Martinez book I've read so far. I'm giving it 4.5 stars. Think of the alien from Monsters vs. Aliens. Monsters vs. Aliens, which I've not seen. Slightly more competent and well, more grown up version of him as the main character. Um, this was a very good laugh during a stressful week. Sandy rated it three stars. I generally like Ailey Martin's work. However, this one was too episodic for my taste. It jumped from one scene to the next and felt like a bunch of disconnected stories. Martin's signature humor is there, but I had trouble with it, with the story. Hey, almost exactly the same as my review. Scott Alio did a terrific job in narrating. There was some real pathos in his voice as Mollusk talks about retiring as an evil warlord. He gets the character's smugness right too. Yeah, that's true. That is one thing I do quite like about this book is that there is a little bit of self-reflection from an even, even evil villain. And like I say, some of my favorite character moments was Zala kind of confronting him about this. It's sort of like, oh, you're not, yeah, sort of like sometimes like, oh, you're not always evil. Sometimes you do look out for good people. It's like, yeah, it's kind of bored being a bit evil. Oh, you're not always sort of like, so the Zala uh, mollusk interaction sort of like, oh, you're not always infallible. Sometimes you you uh, don't succeed. And the way that they, uh, that they, that those interactions and those stories, which actually come just like about an hour before the end of the book or maybe an hour and a half before the end of the book. And like I say, felt like it was, um, you know, hinting at something more interesting to come, but in the, in the end, that ending didn't come. Right, uh, yeah, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm Alec Burridge. Become my friend on goodreads.com, uh, which is the way I know uh, which uh, which books you've enjoyed. Uh, this book has got a 3.79 rating overall in Friends Reviews, 3.67, so, you know, pretty good. Um, I'm giving this book 3.5 stars, I guess, which is a sort of like, yeah, okay kind of recommendation. Not an um, unreserved recommendation, but uh, uh, yeah, I guess you could read this. Um, so uh, join up with the SFBRP listener group and post books that you would like to see me uh, or hear me review um, on, the, on the thread. Books I would like to see reviewed. That's probably the best way to get me to read one of your favorite books or maybe a book that you don't like and you want me to rant about. But don't tell me you just want to rant. Um, and if other people back up your uh, recommendations and say, yes, me too, also would like to see that book reviewed, that's the best way to do it. You can follow me on Instagram too. I'm at Luke Burridge there. YouTube at Luke Burridge there or slash Luke Burridge there. And uh, you check out sfbrp.com. 
and there you'll find the entire archives. There's a page called Episode List, and you can see back through the previous 350 episodes all listed out there, all the books, all the authors. You can sort them by title and series and uh, episode length and star rating and all of those other kind of things. So uh, check it out at sfbrp.com. That's it for me. Thanks a lot for listening, and I'll catch you next time.